Praise the Lord. If you'd like to take your seats. Thank you, team. We are going to uh, continue our study in the book of Revelation. Can we just go back to chapter 10? Don't worry, we're not, uh, we're not going back three chapters and starting again. Can we go to chapter 10 and verse 11? Chapter 10 and verse 11. Just wants us to remind us of something. Remember in chapter 10, by the time of chapter 10, we sort of reached a convenient um, halfway point, chapter 10, 11, 12, in the mid-section of Revelation. And what we find is John was given a, a scroll that was open, and he was told you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. It's important that we remember that, because what we're looking at now, in many respects, is a recapitulation of some things we've already seen. And so tonight, in chapter 13, we're going to be looking at this thing called the beast, what we tend to term the Antichrist kingdom, uh, Antichrist himself in many respects. And remember, we've already seen him. We saw him in... Uh, the opening of the seals. Um, we saw him, uh, the, the uh, fallen angel that came out of the abyss, the bottomless pit called Apollyon, Abaddon, the destroyer. We've already had hints and pictures of him, and we've already looked at him in type and in picture and in biblical references to him an awful lot. Uh, we're going to look at him tonight in a bit more detail. And so John was covering once again, and so in chapter 11 he started talking about a temple, even though there wasn't a temple, so there's going to be one rebuilt. He talked about the two witnesses, uh, especially the focus now turns to Israel, how God is restoring things in Israel. And then in chapter 12, last time, we looked at the great sign that John saw in heaven. Can you, are you all with me? And he saw the great sign in heaven, the woman who was travailing with child, the woman clothed with the sun, with the stars and the moon and all the symbolic pictures there uh, of Israel from the pictures there back in Genesis. And then we saw the great red dragon and we looked at who Satan was. We, we tend to assume we know who he is, but just to reinforce who we are actually talking about. And then if we go to Revelation chapter 12, when we were looking at this sign that John saw, remember, this was a sign. It was a summary of sort of everything. It was sort of a summary of everything in the Bible, the sign in Revelation chapter 12. But that doesn't mean it isn't a real event that's going to happen in the future, just because it includes many things that have also happened in the past. And we looked at that last time. So if we go to Revelation 12, uh, verse 7, we'll remember that this sign said there was going to be a great war. Yeah? Yeah. The, then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient snake called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, world astray, and he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Now, we looked at this last time, but let me just use it as a sort of introduction to what we're going to look at next because a war breaks out in heaven and Michael arises and fights on behalf of Israel. Yeah? When did that happen? When was Michael in conflict with Satan? When was Michael fighting on behalf of Israel? When was Michael uh, doing these things? Because if you remember way back at the beginning when we started studying Revelation, I said there's four basic views, ways of looking at Revelation, of interpreting Revelation. I'm sure you can remember them, but let me just, just state them again just so that we can remember. There's the polemical, polemicist way that everything is just an allegory. There are allegories in Revelation, absolutely. But some people say it's all just an allegory, it's not literal. And then there's the, uh, what we call the historicist view, where everything is just a picture of something that happened in history. That is also a, a truthful aspect of Revelation, but not all of that fits into something that happened in the past. There is the, uh, what we call the preterist view. Preterists believe uh, it was a true prophecy, but it's already all been fulfilled. And much of it already has in pattern and type. 
But then there's the futurist view where it's all still yet to happen. And I believe all four are correct. But you have to remember what prophecy meant to the Apostle John. It was always a pattern. Jesus always talked of prophecy as following predetermined designs. So he'd say when you see the abomination of desolation, he'd talk about it in the future, although it was something that had happened in the past as well. When you understand biblical prophecy, it follows that pattern. And here's a good example. Michael in conflict, in dispute with Satan. When did that happen? Hmm. Can we just put up that slide, please, Ruth? You see, there's obviously this war with Michael and his angels fighting against devil and, and the devil's angels. But if you can just put up that first slide. Okay, Michael's conflict there uh, in Revelation 12 and verse 7. So, when did this happen? Can you put the next one down? Now, in Daniel 10 and verse 20, can we go there, please, Ruth? Daniel 10 and verse 20, Daniel was praying for Israel, yeah? You remember the story? He'd been praying for the restoration of Israel, for the Jews to be returned back to the land. So his prayer is along the lines of Israel being restored back to the land. This prophecy is 600 BC-ish, yeah? 600 BC. So he's talking to Gabriel, he's having the vision, he's, he's seeing these different people talking to him. He said, do you know why I have come to you? This is the angelic uh, being talking to a, a Daniel. Now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them, except Michael, your prince. What's the angel talking about? What's the heavenly being that Daniel is now uh, discussing this? What's he talking about? Daniel's praying for the restoration of the Jews, and he's seeing different visions. And he's told that there are these princes, these beings, these... It, the, the, the Hebrew word is uh, nagid. The, the Greek word is um, archon. It literally means a ruler. They are princes, rulers, spiritual beings that rule geographic areas or nations. Yeah? It's important that we see that or you miss who Michael is. So there's a prince of Greece, there's a prince of Persia. According to the, the general study of what you call your cosmic geography and spiritual beings or territorial spirits, some people tend to call them, there are national spiritual entities that have influence and primary spiritual authority over geographic areas, according to the Bible. Now, the Jews believe there's 70 basic nations, so there's at least 70 of these beings. There may be more. Now, this is happening, Michael is supporting and fighting against them then. Yeah, 600 BC-ish, 500, actually, you know, coming up to 500 BC, towards the end of Daniel's life. And so, to Daniel, this conflict between Michael and the spiritual beings, angels, what we, we generally call these things, was happening in the present yeah? Are we all okay with that? Okay. Go back to the slide. So, it's happening in the present. Okay. Come down one. Right. If we go to Daniel 12 and verse 1. So, this is Daniel again now being given another vision. Daniel 12 and verse 1. He actually carries on from what he's seen before. At that time, not the present. If you read chapter 11, he's just said at the time of the end. So at that time, we'll not go back and read chapter 11 to prove that. But in chapter 11, it says at the time of the end, at the time of the end, when Israel is being restored again, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people 
will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of the nations until then. He's not talking about the present. He's talking about this, this what we would call the great tribulation, a time of distress that has never happened from the beginning of nations until when that happens. This is going to be the big one. The big conflict, worse than anything else has ever happened, Jesus said. Jesus says, if God didn't put an end to it, no one on earth would survive. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. So at that time, Michael arises and this conflict happens. Who's Michael? According to Daniel, he is the ruler, this archon, this Nagid, this prince who protects Israel. Yeah? Daniel's praying for Israel to be restored to the land. And he's told about Michael. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will arrive, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Just, I'll just read the next two verses just to give you a flavor of the content and the context. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Remember the stars, some have been cast to earth, some are in heaven at this time. But you, Daniel, roll up, seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there and increase in knowledge. So Daniel, the scroll was sealed in Revelation. The scroll is unrolled because we're seeing the time of the end. So if we go back to the slide, Ruth, we see that in Daniel's mind, Michael was already fighting on behalf of Israel against these spiritual beings, angels, whatever. Okay, but also in Daniel's mind, there was a future conflict coming where Michael again would be in this conflict protecting Israel in connection with the land and the territory. Remember, these are geographic entities. The prince of Persia, the prince of Greece. Michael is the prince of Israel, right? It's connected to geography, place, and it's a conflict that is, in a sense, beyond the boundaries of time. Now, if you read Jude... Just bring the next one down, Ruth. If you read Jude 1 and verse 9, so let's go there. Jude, verse 9, only one chapter. Even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Right, so going back when Daniel seen it in the present and the future, when did that happen? That was way in the past. What's happening? Michael and the devil are in conflict. Yeah? They are fighting against the body of Moses. What is happening at that moment in time? Israel is being brought into the land. It's a territorial dispute. Moses' body dies on the border of Israel. So Satan is fighting, saying the body's mine because it's in my territory. Michael is disputing over the body of Moses because God needs Moses later on because I believe he's going to be the two witnesses. So the dispute, you tend not to think of this, it's a territorial dispute. Moses is buried on Nebo which those of us who go to Israel, when we go and look at Nebo across the Dead Sea, it's on the border of the Promised Land. It's important that you see this. Michael is fighting over territory, as well as, obviously, righteousness and truth. He's fighting on behalf of Israel. According to the Bible, that is the biblical understanding of who this being is. Archangel. Archangel is not a title. Archon means ruler. It's not like archbishop or archdeacon or arch whatever. Arch means a ruler of the angels. Michael is a ruler of the angels. He's actually the only angel in the Bible called archangel. So this is who Michael is. So let's just remember 
when we we read in Revelation now, what God's actually showing us in chapter 12. Michael at that time will again arise. He's always been fighting in Israel's territory disputes. And he's going to fight again. It's giving us a glimpse, a hint of what a lot of the conflict is actually about. Israel, the land, who owns it? Which spirit takes control? Can Satan win or will Michael defeat him? Well, Michael is defeating him, as we've seen there in chapter 12. He casts him out of heaven, certainly. So we see what's going on here. The focus, the fact that Michael is now fighting and Satan is now being cast to a certain geographic place, the earth, it should be flagging up to us that we're really talking about Israel. Because Michael always was connected with that. Okay, let's go then to chapter 13. So we finished chapter 12 last time, and the dragon was cast to earth. So if we go to chapter 13 and verse 1, we pick up the story now in chapter 13. Now I'm not going to read all of chapter 13 tonight. There's far too much to look at in one, one sitting. So I'll just read up to verse 11, I think. That'll be a good finishing point. So I'm going to read from uh, verse 1 to 11. Okay? So the dragon, Satan, the devil, the old serpent, this, this thing we don't like, stood on the, saw of the shore of the sea. He's now been cast to earth. I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but it had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worship the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. They don't think they're worshipping Satan. They're worshipping this beast, but Satan's behind it. People worship the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worship the beast, asking who is like the beast, who can wage war against it. The focus is on this beast, which is what we're going to look at tonight. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and exercise its authority for 42 months. Three and a half years, time, times, and half a time. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. That's interesting. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. It controls everything. All inhabitants of the earth, all inhabitants of the earth, will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. I'll stop there. Now, there is so much information there. We could literally spend hours just looking at that. I'm going to give you a brief summary of things. We can't go too deep. You just have to take one verse at a time and try and analyze through looking at Scripture what this actually means. What are we looking at? Well, verse 1 has told us, the dragon has come to earth. He stood on the shore of the sea. Remember what the sea is, according to Revelation. We'll look at it again later, maybe even tonight. It's peoples and kingdoms and nations. The Bible tells us that. It's the peoples. He stood looking at the nations of the world, the peoples of the world. Satan's strategy is to do a counterfeit of everything that God does. 
God's plan is perfect. Satan knows that. So if he can copy it, but instead of having God, having himself as God, because that's what Satan thinks he is, then he will copy the same pattern. So he's going to copy God's kingdom. It's the dragon's kingdom. It's Satan's kingdom. But everything that God has, Satan is going to have a counterfeit, a duplicate, a copy of it. So everything that Jesus does, Satan is going to copy. That's why he will deceive so many people. So God has a kingdom. Satan's going to have a kingdom. The, Satan's kingdom is literally going to rule the whole earth. God is a trinity. Satan is going to create his own trinity. We've just seen there a trinity. I don't know if you spotted it. You've got the dragon. You've got beast number one. You've got beast number two. Okay, so when we're talking about antichrist remember we're not just talking about one person that's the mistake a lot of christians and the world thinks the antichrist is just one person it isn't and the bible says it isn't the bible says there are many antichrists there have been many antichrist but there are specific individuals that are going to come the first beast is the one we tend to call the antichrist but the second beast antichrist as well We'll see the difference in a moment. So just as God is a trinity, Satan's going to create a trinity. The Antichrist, this first uh, leader who blasphemes, is going to pretend he is God. And he's going to have a religious system backing him up. That's why people will believe him. There's going to be a temple built. But God's not going to be worshipped in the temple. The Antichrist is. This is why a lot of Christians sort of lose their entire focus and get very excited about a temple being rebuilt in Israel. Remember, that temple is not being built for the church. It's being built for the abomination of desolation. It's being built so Antichrist can take his seat in it and deceive the world. Remember that. Remember that. It is a sign of the end times. So we've got all these things that are going to be counterfeited. So we saw in verse 1, there's going to be a first beast. We saw in verse 11, there's going to be a second beast. There's two primary aspects to this system that Satan is going to implement. Now, let me just remind you something. The beast is a kingdom, not really a person. Did you get that? The beasts, all the way through the Bible, especially in Daniel, we're going to look in a moment, they are kingdoms. Now, the complicating thing is, often in the original languages, king and kingdom are the same words. And often they can overlap. We use the same language ourselves, don't we? And was anyone alive during the war here, the Second World War? Who was alive? Right. Now, we often said, we often said, I wasn't here, my dad was alive, um, we were fighting Hitler in the war, yeah? Well, we weren't, were we? In fact, no one, not one single living soldier in the British army fought Hitler. He was shut away in his bunker. He didn't fight anybody. But we were fighting his empire. So it becomes synonymous, the, the head of the empire, the heads of the beast, with the beast itself. So that's why we often get this overlap of we, we call Antichrist a person, but it's also a kingdom. It's also the second beast. The second beast, who is often referred to as the false prophet, who we won't get, we won't look at tonight, we'll look at next time, is a religious system, a false church. We'll look at that next time. It has two major aspects. And so when you've got a social and economic political system, nation, and a leader and a religious system all united, you've got incredible power when they're all saying the same thing. This is what we're looking at. Satan knows what to do. So there's got this political leader that comes, with, represented by the first beast. Then a religious leader comes, represented by the second beast. Chapter 13 is giving us an overview of that. All the way through the Bible, you'll always find that. Who killed Jesus? The political leader and the religious leaders. Wasn't just one. They had to agree Remember what it said? Herod and Pilate were enemies, 
But the day they agreed to kill Jesus, they became friends. They had a unity, not based on agreement, based on they both hated Jesus. And sadly, that is what we are seeing very, very now happening in our society. People are uniting, not because they like each other, but because they all hate Christians. Doesn't make any sense, because Christians don't hate them. But you're seeing this unity based on hatred coming together, uniting over what they hate rather than what they don't have the answers. They just agree to hate the same things. So you've got this thing coming, Satan's kingdom. Now, a lot of people today refer to this system as the final world order or the new world order. Um, it's going to be a world system that is going to come, that we've just read there, what this beast is going to do. It's going to be a, a, a unity and a unity of nations coming together. We'll see why in a moment. And they're going to come together at this final stage. And it's Satan's plan. It was always Satan's plan. If you go to Babylon, Genesis, um, if you go to Genesis 11, and we'll look at Babylon. Genesis 11, verse 1. Remember what happened right back at the beginning. Before there were any nations, Satan's plan was to create a political, national, and religious unified system that he could control. Now, the whole world had one language and common speech as people moved eastwards, when people are supposed to move west, but these are going east. They found a plain in Shinar, Babylon, and settled there. They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and bitumen for mortar. So they're not building out of stone. God builds his temple out of stone. We're living stones. Satan's empire is built out of bricks. Bricks always represent slavery. In, in the Bible. The Hebrews made bricks. It's a slavery system. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city. Who are they building the city for? Themselves. They're the builders. God's not involved. God's not included in this society. With a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we make a name for ourselves. They're going to create their own religious system, uh, make a name for ourselves. It's about their name, the promotion of themselves, Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Well, God had told them to scatter over. He says, scatter over the earth, be fruitful and multiply. They're doing the exact opposite of what God said. But the Lord came down to see the city, the tower and the people were building. If as one people speak in the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. So God confused the language and scattered them over the earth. This is what Satan was planning right back in Genesis. This is what he's going to achieve at this final stage, everyone's going to speak the way I tell them to speak. We're all going to agree on what our political collect language is. There's going to be no language barriers. It's going to be a system of slavery. You will do it. It's going to be a religious system, a political system, an economic system. It's all going to be built. We don't need God. We'll keep God out of it, and we'll build this system according to Satan's plan. He's going to rebuild Babylon. So, can we go to the second slide, please, Ruth? So, this, this final world order that Satan is going to bring, this final system, this beast entity of empires, of nations, they're going to come together, represent it. We'll look at the horns and the crowns and the heads in a moment, uh, which is an amalgamation of different nations coming together. So, what is it? In summary, then, we'll just take one line at a time, please, Ruth. Firstly... It means there is going to be one government of the world. Right now, I've put there will be, we just read that in verse 7, chapter 13 of Revelation. I've put there, there will be 10 uh, UN areas. I don't mean UN as in the UN Assembly in New York. I mean a unity of nations. Okay, we'll, we'll look at this as we go along because the 10 heads and the, uh, the, the crowns and the... Uh, Horns represent different things. So we know that this is an empire of 10 nations that are going to come together. Okay? Whether they're nations we know them as now, or larger expanded um, areas of influence and uh, common unity, I don't know. So, for example, most people in the world, when I travel the world, they say, you're from Europe. They classify Europe as a single entity. 
Now, we, we would not as English people, especially not, not now that we're leaving, or perhaps we're not leaving, who knows what's going on. But the point is, it might be blocks of nations like that, but there's going to be 10 of them in this final beast empire. Some people go into great detail trying to work out what they are. I don't think we'll know until it happens. Okay, next thing. There's going to be one system of monetary union. You find that out from when you get to the end of chapter 13 and you, you read that everyone will have one mark, one number, and you can't buy or sell without that number. It's going to be a total controlled system of society. Uh, it will be cashless. You won't actually use cash. It, the Bible tells us it will be something on your hand or your head. You'll just do that or something to transact. Okay. Next one. Um, it's going to control the trade of the world. You know, there, there's going to be um, a world trade organization, whether it's the WTO as we know it now or something different, who knows? Um, and, and you find out that they also trade in the souls and lives of people. So it seems to legitimize slavery or at least hint at that, which is very interesting because there are some uh, groups around that still do believe slavery is totally acceptable. Um, there's going to be one legal code that is applicable to everyone. If you don't obey, you get killed. It's as simple as that. You are punished if you do not obey this world system, this world order. People are literally killed if they don't go along with it. Next one. There's going to be one supreme leader, this leader that comes from the first beast. Okay, what Daniel, called the what Daniel called the final horn that comes up from this beast. And he is going to be um, accepted as God, literally worshipped. Now, even today, you literally get people in some, you think of North Korea, um, you think of people like Stalin or Mao Zedong or Hitler himself, they were literally worshipped. They were literally believed to have been sent by God um, to be the head of everything. And the, the, the people of that, those nations literally were forced into that. And a lot of them really believed that. And this is what's going to happen, as we're told very clearly throughout the Bible, but especially here in Revelation. He's going to be accepted as God himself. And there's going to be what you could call a communication system, one way of absolute control of what people can say, hear, think. Everything's going to be controlled, what you can say. There's going to be no freedom of speech as we would know it or freedom of the press as we would know it. It's going to be uh, absolutely manipulated and controlled. Um, and we get hints at that there in verse 15 and onwards and in other places in the Bible. So this is what we're looking at. This is this beast that they've seen. It's bringing in all this, okay? So, what is this beast, this final empire? What is it? Well, if you go to Revelation 17, Revelation chapter 17, verse 9, remember we've seen this beast with the, with the heads and the horns and the crowns, but what does that mean? It's calls for a mind of wisdom. Now, this is, this is several chapters uh, further on, but looking back at the beast's religious system, which is called uh, the, the harlot of Babylon, the great prostitute who rides this beast. It's calls for a mind of wisdom. Seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Okay, so who are the heads of the beast? Kings. They're also geographic areas. Remember what we've just looked at with Michael's battle. They're real people fighting over real geographic areas. These are real leaders, but they're also seven hills or seven mountains. So, so they're also real geographic places. Okay? I suppose it's like when you're saying that you associate the head with the state. You know, the queen is the head of state, so she is England in one sense, is Great Britain in one sense. Yeah, it's sort of, I suppose, like that. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other is not yet come. That's very interesting. We'll look at this later, uh, not tonight. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. The beast who once was, now is not, is the eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction, his perdition. Don't worry about that. We'll look at that later on. So the seven heads are seven kings. The ten horns are also kingdoms or kings. 
right? We've just seen that very clearly. Revelation itself explains that for us. Okay, are we any wiser? The, the study of this topic is massive. I mean, people write entire books just about this, this one thing, trying to identify this beast, the horns, the heads, the crowns, who they are, what they're going to come, what they represent. If we go to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 2, remember, we've already been told about this in the Old Testament. It's already all been prophesied. John's only actually repeating and uh, illuminating and giving increased revelation on what you should already have known in the Old Testament. John expects us to have already read this because we've already got Daniel's prophecies and other prophecies, especially in Zechariah, about what some of this is. So Daniel said, In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea, four great beasts, each different from the other, came up out of the sea. Right, let's just stop there. So Daniel is seeing four beasts. Okay, but we've just seen that there's sort of seven of them. There's two beasts in uh, Revelation 13, but then when we read 17, there's the heads and the kingdoms, and th there appears to be seven of those. Right, Daniel is prophesying, we've already said, around 6th century BC, 530-ish maybe, BC, okay? Daniel is looking to the future. He's not including the kingdoms and empires that had happened before him. So from 530 BC-ish, 6th century BC, are you still with me? I'll try and make this as simple as I can. There would be four world empires that will come from the time of Daniel. Now, Daniel was one of the captives in Babylon. Yeah? The first beast was like a lion. It had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being and the mind of a human was given to it. Okay, keep going. And there before me was a second beast, looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side. I'll not go through all this. It'll get too complicated. And after that, verse 6, I looked and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And then he describes the aspects of the leopard. Go to verse 7. After that, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was a fourth beast, Terrifying and frightening, very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims, trampled underfoot, whatever was left. It was different from all the other beasts, and it had ten horns. So, Daniel sees four beasts. He's praying about the nation of Israel. From 500, between 500 and 600 B.C., there would come four empires that would control Israel, just as Daniel saw. Then Israel would be destroyed. So Babylon destroyed the temple, 586 BC. Babylon was then destroyed by the next beast, Persia. Persia took over Babylon. Just in the time of Daniel. Daniel was still alive when the Persians took over Babylon. Yeah? Persia was taken over by the Greek Empire. Alexander the Great conquered the Persians. Battle of Isis, 333 BC. Greek became the national language of every nation. And the Greek Empire spread over all the world the third beast. Daniel actually even identifies the beast. What has the angel told Daniel? He's in Babylon, but then the prince of Persia comes, and then the prince of Greece comes. Yeah? Three beasts. Three world empires that control Israel. They literally, Israel had no national independence. They were subject to these empires. But it's the fourth beast that causes Daniel to be ill. He sees a fourth beast, terrible, powerful. It's an amalgamation of all the other beasts. Now, in a literal, preterist fulfillment, the Roman Empire conquered the Greek Empire and impl implemented Roman rule over everything that had been the Greek Empire, including Israel. So that was the fourth 
beast. Yes. But John says in Revelation that the fourth beast is going to be revived. It's going to come back. And this is why theologians, Bible students call this beast the revived Roman Empire. Now, if you go back to uh, Revelation 13, I'll start reading at verse 2. The beast I saw remember, resembled a leopard, had feet like that of a bear, and the mouth like that of a lion. What had Daniel seen? The three beasts represented by a lion, bear, and leopard. He sees exactly the same beast, but it's in reverse order. It's not lion, bear, leopard. It's leopard, bear, lion. Why? Daniel was looking ahead in time. John is looking from Revelation's view backward in time, but it's still seeing the same beast. It's an amalgamation of the former empires that controlled Israel that is going to come back. Now, seeing that it was Rome that was the fourth empire, many people think this beast is just a literal resurrection of what was the Roman Empire. And that could be so. But the Roman Empire was a lot bigger than a lot of people think it was. It wasn't just Europe. It was all the northern coast of Africa. It was all the Middle East. It was especially Turkey. That was the headquarters of many of the Roman city-states. It also extended down into Babylon towards Persia. So we're talking about the whole of this area that what we would call the, the the biblical geography and this is the beast that john is describing to us this final beast in fact if you go back to daniel 7 and verse 16 so this beast that is and was but yet is to come we've already seen in history what this beast is but it's going to be bigger on a much bigger scale, but the same basis, especially pertaining to its focus against Israel. Okay, so Daniel's confused about this vision. It's not just you. Daniel doesn't understand what's going on. I approached one of them standing there and asked him the meaning of all this. So he told me and gave the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are the four kings that will rise from the earth, or four kingdoms. But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Just read, just read on a bit, just to get Daniel's understanding of what we're looking at. Then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others. We get what happened in the past. What about this final terrifying beast? That's what we want to understand. This one that's going to come. It was different from all the others. Most terrifying, iron teeth, bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims, trampled underfoot whatever was left. This is an empire that destroys everything to satisfy itself. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up, the one with which three of them fell. This other horn that comes up, sometimes called the little horn, this is what we call the Antichrist. Remember, the horn is a king. There's going to king, be a king come out of this empire, this beast empire. This is that horn, the Antichrist. Horn is always a symbol of this, this, this strength. This that's going to come up. The horn that looked more imposing than all the others, that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. This horn is going to boast that he is the answer. Just read down. We'll go just carry on for a while. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and prevailing against them or defeating them, prevailing against them in the King James until the Ancient of Days came pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. Then the kingdom comes after that, God's kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom, this empire that will appear on the earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth. So it's not the, just the Roman Empire, is it? Because the Roman Empire did not devour the whole earth. The British Empire was bigger than the Roman Empire. Trampling it down and crushing it. Just go down. The ten horns are the ten kings who will come from this kingdom. You see, we've just read it in Revelation. Daniel's already said what it is. 
After them, another king will arise. He'll, this is this, this king again, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue the three kings. There's going to be this antichrist, as we call him, who comes out from this kingdom. What will he do? He will speak against the Most High. He will oppress his holy people. He will try to change the Moedim, the set times and laws, the, the set plan of God. He'll try and change it. The holy people will be delivered into his hands. Just think about that for a minute. God is going to give his people to him. So the question is, who are those people? Who are those people that the gates of hell prevails against? Who are those people that Satan conquers and prevails against? It cannot be the church. Or Jesus is a liar. Because Jesus says, the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. And he said it on Satan's territory on Mount Hermon. He stood there where Mount Hermon was, where the fallen angels came. Satan's access point, the gate of heaven, Mount Hermon is called, and said, you will not get my church. So who he's talking about Israel. Daniel didn't even know what the church was. The church was the hidden mystery from the beginning of time. Now, we looked at this when we looked at the first few chapters of Revelation, so I'm not going to go through all that again. But we're not talking necessarily about the church. There will be saints and believers, and especially the remnant of Israel. But the church is different. It's always different. And these holy people will be delivered into his time. And there it is again. Time, time, half a time. Three and a half years. 42 months. Okay? So it's already been prophesied in the Old Testament. John is giving us increased revelation. So he's seeing this beast now, but in reverse from that time. It's this world empire from which this world leader comes up, this head horn who will speak against God, will blaspheme God, will claim he is God, but he'll come out of a system that is controlling the earth. Okay, so we've got that basic understanding of what this beast empire is. Right, now we saw in Genesis 11 that the first world empire with a dictator called Nimrod, um, who started in Babylon, uh, and moved it, then moved into Assyria. So Daniel sees four empires throughout the world, yeah, that would be coming. But there's more than four empires. That was just from Daniel's time. If you start from the beginning in Genesis, you will find there are seven empires. What a surprise! There would be seven, wouldn't there? There's seven empires. Biblical empires, obviously there's lots more empires, but not concerning biblical revelation. And they are the empires that Satan has tried to use to bring his kingdom on earth. And especially destroy the Jews or the Jewish people. Okay, And each one of these empires, the head of that empire claimed divinity. They claimed they were deity they claimed they were God, right? Now, the British Empire was very big, but no one was daft enough, because they were English, to claim to be God, right? These empires, biblical empires, their head of state did expect to be worshipped and claimed to be God. And that's what we find. These empires at the end, they're going to be brought back together they're going to be re-resurrected. Okay, can we go to that next slide? So the first empire, as I'm sure you all know, was uh, the empire of Nimrod. He's mentioned there in Genesis 10, 8. We'll not go through the scriptures. And he started his empire, first of all in Babylon, and then to Nineveh, uh, Kala, and different places there in the Mesopotamian Fertile Crescent. And he was the first world dictator who claimed to be God. Now, he's mentioned there in the Bible, uh, extra-biblical uh, texts say he died by having his head cut off. Remember, the Antichrist dies from a head wound, by the way. 
And he oppressed God's people. He persecuted Abraham. If you read the extra, extra biblical literature, that's one of the reasons Abraham had to leave Ur of the Chaldees. He had to leave that region and go to the land God showed him because he wouldn't worship in the false system of Babylon. So that's how it all started. That's how it's going to finish. Okay? That's why the Assyrian is often a cryptic term for the Antichrist throughout the Bible. Micah, uh, Isaiah, they call this when the Assyrian comes. It's, it's a cryptic term for, uh, for the Antichrist. Notice there, uh, when we looked at the rider on the white horse, he was an archer. And archers, people with bows, these kings were often depicted as um, having a bow. It's, it's no, again, one of the giveaways of uh, who Antichrist is. Jesus doesn't have a bow, he has a sword. But these kings used to love showing themselves with bows. And that's why the symbols of the man God rejects often has a bow. Ishmael had a bow. Uh, Esau had a bow. Jacob didn't. Isaac didn't. Okay? They were hunters. Nimrod was a mighty hunter bef uh, before the Lord, but he rebelled against God. Okay? So that's how it started. First kingdom. Second kingdom empire really it's more than just one nation they controlled nations obviously we know the egyptians one of the first uh, main empires after um, nimrod and the uh, assyrian babylonian the, the ancient chaldean sumerian region you get egypt and we all know about egypt pharaoh crops up there for the first time in genesis 12 15 where he takes abraham's wife remember the beast Antichrist, Satan, wants to have the church, but he can't have her. He wants to control God's people. Just as Nimrod was a killer, what did the pharaohs do? Kill the Jewish babies. Enslave the Jewish people, according to the biblical uh, narrative there through Genesis and Exodus, okay? So that was the second empire, going back way, you know, 2000 BC. Okay, then... You got, I know we've seen Babylon in the Assyrian Empire, but this is really what you call um, Neo-Babylon. Babylon came back up again. It was there at the beginning, then it disappeared. Then in the middle of history, it came back again. And this is the empire under Nebuchadnezzar uh, that destroyed the Jewish nation, that, that conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the temple there, 600 BC, took captives, took Daniel, um, Nebuchadnezzar, Nabopolassar, Belshazzar, the kings of Babylon during the 6th uh, century BC, and they were a type of antichrist. Nebuchadnezzar, what did he do? Threw the Hebrews into the fiery furnace, build a statue that was consisted of sixers, and made people bow down and worship him as God. Direct picture and type of antichrist, uh, king of Babylon. In fact, Satan himself is called the king of Babylon um, in uh, the prophecies of uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel. Okay, so third kingdom. Although it's a repeat, but we'll call the first one the Assyrian. Whichever one you count, Assyria and Babylon, there's still, the, still only three kingdoms. Okay? Next one. After Babylon, Babylon conquered by the Persians, Cyrus the Great, who in many respects uh, did very good things, but some of his, uh, the other kings, especially Xerxes and uh, uh, Tasha Xerxes, Darius, these people, um, they, again, claimed deity, persecuted uh, God's people later on, you've read the stories of Esther, they were even going to wipe them out at one point. Um, and again, another picture of one of these seven biblical antichrist kingdoms. Okay, move on to the next one. Persians conquered by Alexander the Great, and he died very young, only in his 30s, Alexander the Great, around, around 30, I forget his exact age, and he handed it over to his generals, four generals, and the two generals that fought over Israel were the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, and the king of the Seleucids, the king of the north, which is a term of Antichrist in Daniel's prophecies, was the uh, Antiochus, and especially Antiochus IV. He was the one who 
instigated the abomination of desolation, desecrated the temples, banned the Bible, banned circumcision, uh, circumcision, banned worshipping God, killed people who worship the true God, and stopped people worshipping in the temple. The Jews revolted against him, rededicated the temple. The Feast of Hanukkah still um, celebrates that. And the Greeks ruled for such a long time that the whole nations became Hellenized, spoke Greek, and controlled that part of the world. But then the Greeks were taken over by the final world empire, the Romans, who were uh, first century BC, around that time, conquered the Greeks, took over Israel and the, the known world as they knew it at that point. Uh, but we've already seen that Rome is going to be in two parts. Daniel actually prophesied it would be when he saw his picture of the statue and said the final empire would be like two legs. There'd be two parts to it. The first part has already been the Roman historical empire as we knew it. Never really went away, you know. It just sort of split up into its designated nations. And have you noticed each one of those nations has had its time sort of trying to rule the world? Yeah, Spanish empire conquered all of Latin America and parts of the world and they still speak Spanish today. British Empire conquered a fourth of the globe, a lot of the world speaking English today. The Dutch, many Dutch took over, you know, Holland, the, um, the, Bel the Belgians, I mean, the, Bel the biggest land grant in history was the, the Belgian king buying Congo in Africa. And so you, you look at all the world and it's sort of at some point being controlled by members of the Roman Empire. And that's why today, you've still got most people in the world either speaking British, uh, English, or French, or Spanish. Now, you've got China, but even China was uh, more or less controlled by the Western nations at some point. We controlled Hong Kong and places like Shanghai, and even China for many years was subjugated by the nations of the old Roman Empire. America is basically a, you know, a bunch of immigrants controlled by the old Roman Empire nations. That's going to come back. It's going to be what we call Rome Part 2. This final beast that is part of the original seven. But it's going to be more terrifying than all of them put together. So we've seen there those seven nations. Uh, the leaders claim deity. When this final unity of nations comes back together on, in, the, in the form of this revived Roman Empire. Remember, Rome was much bigger than just Western Europe. It was also North Africa. It was also the Middle East. And it's going to come back under one system of control. It's been prophesied. It is going to happen. We can see it now not in its complete form, but we can see it forming all ready. Okay, go back to Revelation chapter 13 then. Revelation 13 and verse 3. So this beast comes. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. How are you healed of being fatally killed? Well, you must be resurrected. What is Satan doing? He's reviving his kingdom. He is bringing a leader. The leader is going to copy Jesus. He's going to prove to the world that he's God. People are going to be amazed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. Why? He obviously has supernatural power. He is greater than any other man. There's something astonishing and amazing about him. I mean, we see this kind of weird fanaticism with world leaders now, don't we? Why is it people think, even Christians think, that certain politicians are their savior? They're just politicians. But they're almost worshipped as a kind of messiah who's going to give them everything they want. They never do, do they? They can't. But this is what's going to happen. It's interesting. He can only pull it off for three and a half years. It's like most politicians. You know, no matter how good they are, by four years is up, you've had enough of them and you want someone else in. He's only going to pull it off for three and a half years. But he is going to pull it off. Verse 4, people worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. So they're worshipping this beast, by, but by default worshipping the devil. 
but they don't think they are. I'm sure most sane people, I know there's a few strange people out there that will claim to be Luciferians or Satan worshippers, but most sane people aren't going to worship the devil, are they? But they're going to worship someone who's going to give them everything they want and appear supernaturally empowered and the greatest leader the world's ever seen. You worship him, even if he does belong to the devil. If he'll give us what he wants, we don't care who he is. If they'll give us the money and the health care and the systems and the education and the economics and the hope and the future, and if he can just promise all this stuff, we'll follow him even if he's leading us to hell because he'll make us happy. He'll give us what we want. Yeah, for three and a half years. Then everything gets destroyed. He's give great authority to the beast, and they also worship the beast and ask, who is like this beast? Who can wage war against it? He's, this guy's undefeatable. This guy's greater than everybody. This guy is just amazing. This guy, if you read on, he can make fire come out of the sky. This guy has supernatural power. This guy can perform miracles. I mean, we see some people being worshipped today because they can do miracles, but imagine a, a prime minister who can do miracles. He's going to counterfeit Jesus. When you read John's vision of what's going on in this, if you go to Revelation 17 and verse 8, now this is the Apostle John. Now the Apostle John has got to be my favorite apostle. Okay? Some of you might like Paul and Peter, but you're wrong. John is the best apostle. He's just, I just love him. He's just, he knew Jesus the best. When they all ran away, John didn't. When they all went at the tomb, John was. You know, when Antichrist, Jesus was there, John knew who he was. You know, it's like, I'd have just asked John everything. I wouldn't have asked Peter a thing. I'd have asked John everything, because he seemed to always be on the ball. But when you go to uh, Revelation chapter 17, go to verse 7. The angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. John can't grasp it. He's astonished by it all. What is it he's seeing? He's seeing something that causes, ab it's like, what? Does he even look like Jesus? Does he talk like Jesus? Does he behave like Jesus? We've already seen the second beast looks like a lamb. Well, who's the lamb in Revelation? Jesus. Jesus is always the lamb. Does he even look like... I mean, this gives way to some very strange conspiracy theories. I'm not saying they might not be true, that they somehow get the DNA of Jesus and clone him. I mean, whether that's true or not, I don't know. It's scientifically feasible, but I don't think you have to necessarily go along with that. But some people think that, that they're going to get the DNA of some of these great uh, leads of the past. Some people think even Nimrod himself and clone him. Some people go into all the science about that. I'm not saying that is what it is. I'm just saying there's something John sees that he goes like, wow, it's almost as if even John is astonished by all this empire and religious system. And I mean, imagine a religious system that claims to be Christian, that claims to worship Jesus, that claims to belong to God and is actually worshiping the devil. I mean, that would cause astonishment, but it's entirely possible, entirely possible. And so go back to verse four of chapter 13. So this guy has got, so much power. In verse 5, the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words. His oratorical skills are so convincing, everyone is mesmerized by listening to this guy. I mean, you think of people like Hitler, who people literally, even people who knew he was evil, said when he spoke, you were just captivated. We don't get it because he speaks German. But the German people just worshipped him. They just were mesmerized by his ability to speak. Even though he was filled with hate, he gave such hope and promise and pride back to the German people. They followed him, even to their own destruction, to their own perdition. And I think the Antichrist, Hitler, is a very good example. Remember, there's been many Antichrists, the Bible tells us, of, of what he will be like. All power was given to him. It's amazing, you know, I was, I was listening to a documentary uh, last week about the uh, German... Um, Luftwaffe pilots that were shot down during the Battle of Britain 1940 
and uh, they were interviewing some of the British, you know, the, uh, the home guard and the British soldiers who captured these pilots once they'd been shot down to take them off to the, the POW prisoner of war camps. And they all said exactly the same thing. These Germans, although they'd been shot down and they'd now been captured and put in prison, they all said the same thing. They were so arrogantly, assertively sure that Hitler was undefeatable, they weren't remotely scared. They actually talked to the, the, the British soldiers who captured them, you better be nice to us because Hitler's going to come and conquer you all. And they were absolutely certain that was going to happen. Not a single doubt in there. They had been so indoctrinated that their leader, their Fuhrer, could not be defeated. They would follow him to death. This is exactly what this Antichrist is going to do but to the whole world. People will think he's God. He cannot do anything wrong. No one can defeat him. He can do anything. He can achieve anything. He can say the right words. He even uh, blasphemes and everyone goes along with it. He speaks against God and everyone's happy because he is God. And exercises authority but only for 42 months only for this three and a half year period. And then in verse six there, he opens his mouth to blaspheme God. He doesn't need God now. Society is quite happy to blaspheme God now because we don't need God. We've got God in our political, economic, and monetary and education system. Get rid of God, get him out of the schools, get him out of the economy, get him out of politics, remove him. We are preparing the way for this system to take root. We don't have God now in schools. We don't have him in hospitals. The NHS, when it was started, began with prayer. Now you can't pray or you'll be sacked. It's amazing what's happened in one generation. We have gone from a nation that revered the name of God. Blasphemy wasn't even allowed on the airwaves, TV, radio. You couldn't, you couldn't say the name of God in vain. It wasn't allowed. Now there isn't a show without it. Even kids' programs have it. Blaspheme God, you see, once, once it gets, it just, it rolls and it rolls and it gets worse and worse, slanders his name, slanders heaven and those who are in heaven. That's really interesting. Who's he speaking about? It's a bunch of people who are now in heaven. Slandering them, speaking against them, telling lies, but people are believing him. So he's slandering this, just read down. Verse 7. So this beast given power to wage war against God's holy people. Now we've just seen that in Daniel. Who were the holy people in Daniel? The people of Israel. Right? I don't know if you've noticed, but Israel can't be beat. Have, have, you, have you studied history? Have you studied what's happened since 1948? Have you noticed what happens to anybody that attacks Israel? Have you noticed even the Six-Day War, 1967? when the United Arab Armies of Egypt and Syria and Lebanon and Jordan all united and outnumbered Israel on a massive scale, Israel just basically defeated them all in six days. They had a day off. You know, military strategists say that it's just not possible. It's, it's just, they call it the miracle war. And even the Yom Kippur war, where they attacked Israel on the holy day and took them by surprise, Israel ended up just driving them back. It's like, it can't happen. You know, and why does no one want to launch a war against Israel? Because they always lose. But yet Israel's this tiny little insignificant nothing. You know, the, the Muslim nations, you, you, you put them on a map and then you can't even see Israel. But yet, in this final period, this beast, this empire, goes to war against God's holy people and prevails against them conquers them so what's going to happen to the Jews a time of trouble worse than has ever existed including the Holocaust and Zachariah goes into great detail about that what Jesus says a time so horrendous a time so terrible that's yet to come and then it is it conquers Israel that's why Certainly, you think all the Muslim nations, they're going to worship this guy. He's finally defeated Israel. The thorn in the flesh of the Islamic caliphate. 
you know, the belief that Muslim nations can never be taken over and once land has been claimed as Islamic, it cannot be given back to a non-Muslim. -is -is but Israel's the, the antagonist to that. But this guy wins all the Muslims over pretty quickly. Given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. John's been, John's been told, remember, chapter 10, to prophesy to every tribe, people, language, and nation. Why? Because that's what this beast is going to take over, every single one. So John's letting everybody know in advance what's going to happen, right? Is it going to stop it happening? No, because most people don't even read it. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. So this is what this empire is going to bring. And remember, he's prevailing against all this, which is why I don't believe it can mean the church. Because it can't be what, it's, it, you know, it can't be, it, it, it doesn't fit. Because the church was promised, if you remember, can you just go back to uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10? Remember in the church age, the seven period dispensation of the church age that we looked at, the churches were promised something. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. So Jesus speaking to his church, remember this is Jesus speaking here, he's telling the church, I'm going to keep you from that final hour. Yeah? And in that final hour, Everyone is given into the hands of this beast and he conquers God's holy people. So I don't believe he can be talking about the church because it can't be both. And as we've seen in Daniel, Daniel is talking about Israel. And there is a distinction between the church and Israel. Okay. And I think if you get it all just mixed up, that Israel no longer exists and it's just whoever believes in God. Now, there is truth in that. Without believing in Jesus the Messiah, it doesn't matter whether you're Jewish or Gentile. That's the only way to be saved. But at this period in time, these archon leaders are going to rise again and the nations are going to come together as Daniel prophesied and as John sees, and it's going to be back according to what that original vision was. And so if you go back to Revelation chapter, well, actually, just go down two verses from there. Look at verse 13. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Yeah? When God was talking to the churches, he always said that seven times. Whoever, just go back. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, let's go back now to Revelation 13, of what's happening in this time of Antichrist, running amok, making everyone worship him, killing people who don't worship him. Revelation 13, verse 9. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Where's the next bit? It's not there. Now, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, is said in Revelation seven times. And then it's said again, but it doesn't say to the churches. The church is not there. Right? Just go back to verse 8. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. He who has ears to hear, let them hear. Now, here John might be reminding them what he said back to the churches back in the previous first three chapters. But he doesn't use the word church, and the word church is never used after chapter 3. Even though it's used over and over and over again. It's never used after chapter 3. They are saints, believers, Israel, God's people, not the church. The church is God's bride. 
So, if anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed by the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness of part of God's people. Obviously, there's still God's people. There's still people going to have faith in God, but they've rejected the church, or, or this may in, indeed refer to Israel uh, predominantly, God's people who are going to believe at this final stage. So... God's saying that all this is going to happen, and if you're going to go into captivity, you're going into captivity. If you're going to die, you're going to die. If you're going to be killed, you're going to be killed. You're going to have to patiently endure this three and a half year period. So, we can see that Daniel didn't see the church because of we've already seen in all the previous teachings, which I'm not going to go over again, the church is God's bride. The bride in the Bible is always taken to safety. She is never allowed to be defiled by Antichrist. Never. She's always rescued. Always has been. Always was. Always will be. If God saved people in the past, he's going to save his bride. That doesn't mean they won't, we won't go through persecution, but this final stage, that final horrendous stage of this period of time, um, is clearly never portrayed here directly to the church. Not in the language. Okay then, go back to uh, chapter 13 and verse 9 then. So let's take a look at uh, another aspect of this Antichrist system. So whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Anyone to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient, patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Okay, go to the next verse. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. So now we get the second aspect of this beast system, this antichrist system. And this is the religious aspect of it. So this person, uh, often called the false prophet, the second beast comes out of the earth. Now some people make a big difference about the fact that one comes out of the sea and one comes out of the earth and take that as a hint to mean one will be Jew and one will be Gentile because the waters represent the nations of the earth as, as mentioned in uh, the book of Revelation of what it represents and the earth, the land is often a picture of Israel itself and many people argue that the Jews would not follow a religious leader unless in some way he appealed to the Jews. And that may or may not be true, I, I, I don't know. But uh, it had two horns like a lamb, so it, it has two aspects to it. So it might be an amalgamation of two religions. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? If two, the two biggest world religions could combine... Uh, and convince the Jews, then you've got the three monotheistic religions all joined together in one ecumenical unity. Isn't that lovely? Wouldn't we all like that? Well, that's really what the world wants, isn't it? Why can't all the religious people just agree and get on with each other and join together and then there'll be harmony? Yes, you'll be worshipping the devil. Um, so he's got two horns like a lamb so people think this is the lamb oh this is a form of christianity looks like the lamb no it's the dragon it might look like the lamb but it's actually the dragon it might look christian it's actually satanic it might claim to be christian but it's not and today there are too many christians compromising on fundamental truths i don't mean um, arguable aspects, I mean basic fundamental truths of the authority of Scripture, on the doctrine of the Trinity, on the deity of Jesus Christ. Some people are almost just, oh, well, that doesn't really matter. As long as we all claim we're Christian and we get on with each other, that's all that counts. No, you've denied truth. Jesus is truth. So this religious system that might look like Jesus, it might look Christian, it might look like the Lamb, but it's not. It's the dragon. So, I'm not going to go through the rest of it now. I just want us to try and understand something of why is everyone duped by this? Why does it cost... Well, it looks okay, so it must be okay. Looks like a lamb, so it must be okay. Uh, you know, he says he believes in Jesus, so he must be a good person. Well, that's not necessarily the case at all. 
And this is what the second beast, the second religious antichrist is going to do. Remember, Satan is going to have two witnesses. He's got rid of the two witnesses of God. He's going to have his own two witnesses, the two different types of beast. So, is there someone in the Bible that fits this? Well, there's lots. There's lots of people that fit this picture of Antichrist. If you just put these charts up, Ruth, I'll quickly go through these. We've looked at these before in the past, so I'll not dwell on them or go through them. But um, y- you'll notice this Antichrist system, the Antichrist, whether the religious Antichrist or the political Antichrist, um, you find them all the way through the Bible. We tend to call them the Antichrist, because that's what he's called there in uh, John's first epistle. Uh, chapter 2, verse 22, it literally means uh, in the place of Christ. It doesn't just mean against Christ. We think of anti meaning against. The Greek word anti actually means in place of. If you replace something with something else, that is anti that. Antichrist is something that replaces the true Christ. Yeah? Remember, Christos means anointing. So it's someone who has an anointing, but it's, it's not the real anointing. Yeah? And, it, and uh, it denies the Trinity, John tells us there. Might claim they believe in God, but they don't believe in the Trinity. Well, then you don't believe in my God. You might believe in your God, but the God of the Bible is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you don't believe in that God, what you believe in isn't God. Um, obviously, he's called the seed of the serpent. Right back there, God warned us, even when Adam and Eve were in the garden, God said there is going to be a seed of Satan come. Just as there's a seed of the woman who is Jesus Christ, the devil is going to have a seed. This is who he's going to be, the, 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 the seed of Satan. God's had his ultimate man. Satan's going to have his ultimate man. He's the Antichrist, this, this deceiver at the end. He's called the deceiver there in, in uh, John's second epistle. By the way, there's, there's dozens and dozens of names for Antichrist in the Bible. I'm just giving you some of the most familiar ones. Why? Because he's a deceiver. He denies uh, truths, especially Christ's uh, deity and incarnation. He might deny the resurrection. He can deny any truth, but he deceives people by telling half-truths all the time. And he gives people what they want. So he deceives people. He deceived Adam and Eve in the garden, deceived the woman. He'll deceive people in the church. If he could deceive back in the past with people were perfect, he's certainly going to deceive people today. Okay. By the way, deception is uh, the single biggest warning Jesus gave us in the end times. Right. The single biggest sign, he said, Four times he gave this sign. Most of the other signs he only gave once. But in the Olivet Discourse, four times Jesus said, people will be deceived. See that you be not deceived. Many will be deceived. He kept saying the number one sign of the end times is that people will just be deceived. They'll think they believe in the truth when they're not. So he's called the deceiver, that deceiver. He's called the man of sin in Thessalonians. We'll look at that in a second. Um, I've, I've given you some examples there in the, in the parentheses brackets, but that's, they're just some other examples of that. The man of sin, Cain was the first man who murdered. Obviously, he didn't deal with sin. He let sin control him. Uh, and that's what we do today, isn't it? Instead of dealing with sin, we justify sin. So we become people of sin. My sin is how, who I am. I was born like this. That's what I feel like. That's what I like. That's what I want to do. You shouldn't be judging me for my sin. Well, you've become a man of sin then, or a woman of sin. You have now appropriated your sin instead of letting God deal with it, or at least deny, at least saying it's wrong, even if you did it. You're now saying it's good, and you're saying people who say it's wrong are evil. That's what uh, Jesus said would happen in the end times. Good will be called evil, evil will be called good. We will boast of our sin instead of dealing with it. We've become people of sin. Uh, he's called the lawless one. You remember Herod and the, the kings of the northern kingdom, they just did what they want. They broke God's law. They claimed to be the kings of Israel and then murdered people or did whatever they wanted. They became lawless. The man of sin uh, brings in the beast system. It's a lawless system. You can't have laws prohibiting people's behavior. You actually promote lawlessness as freedom. You are free to do whatever you feel. 
and everything will be all right. No, we will create lawlessness and society will collapse and be destroyed. But that's what he does. He creates lawlessness. He's called the prince who will come. Remember, you know, the, the archon, the ruler, just like the Romans who came. Remember Daniel prophesied that uh, Jerusalem will be, be destroyed by the people of the prince who will come, which is a very strange phrase. So he said, Jerusalem will be destroyed by the people of the final prince who is yet to come. So in other words, Daniel is saying the Romans destroyed the temple, so this final prince is going to be from the Roman Empire. In a, he said it in a cryptic way, but that's what he's saying. That's what he's called this prince who will come. Remember, uh, it's not just Antichrist. John tells us there in 1 John 4, 3, that the, it, Antichrist is a spirit as well as a, a, an eventual person. There's been many Antichrists, but there's the spirit of Antichrist, many Antichrists, right? There are Antichrists come to church. They claim to believe in Jesus, but they actually do the opposite of what Jesus wants. They're lawless. They appropriate sin. They, they deceive people. It's, you know, it's a sad truth. We, we mustn't be shocked about this. Jesus had it in his own disciples. So we're going to have it in our churches. Okay, just a few more. Then we'll look at one in particular. He's called the proud king there, especially pointing towards people like Alexander the Great, who just thought they were God and could conquer who they wanted. He's called the little horn. You know, the one who comes up, the horn from this beast, this ruler, like the Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth of the Seleucid empires. He's called the idol pastor. You know, the one who makes himself an idol. He wants people to worship him. And, the, you know, the images of the kings who set them, you know, their own deity up, people to worship themselves. Zechariah talks about that. Jesus says he's one who would come in his own name. Remember Nimrod, I will rebel, is what his name says. I will build my temple. I will build my king. I even find, sadly, some leaders talking in this way. I'm going to build my church, and I'm doing it. And they're talking as though it's their church, and they're doing it, and it's their vision, and it's their power, and it's Antichrist. Why are you talking like that? It's God's bride. It's God's house. It's God's temple. It's not ours. We are his. We can easily slip into Antichrist language without even realizing it. Um, Jesus says, you reject me because I honor my father. When someone comes boasting in his own name, you'll listen to him. It's amazing how many people tell me this pastor or this leader who they've seen on TV is great because he makes great boasts about how brilliant he is. You don't know him. You don't know what he's doing. You find out later he's been sleeping around, he's been embezzling money, he's been... You find all this out later and say, oh, well, who'd have guessed? Well, you shouldn't have believed him in the first place. You judge people by their fruits and how they live their life, not because they can make great boasts. Anyone can do that. He's uh, the beast, the horn, the heads that we've just seen there in Revelation, this coming world leader. He's the fallen star that we looked at there in the abyss that comes out of the abyss, who was called Apollyon, uh, the, the son of perdition. He's also called there uh, in 2 Thessalonians. Now, there's only one other person called the son of perdition in the Bible. Judas, yeah? So, is the Bible giving us a very clear, especially for this religious aspect of the Antichrist, is the Bible showing us who the son of perdition is, what he will be like, how we will be able to identify him, if we can? So in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3 there, that's where it uses this phrase. Can we go to 2 Thessalonians verse 2? And verse 1. Can we go into the King James? Let no man deceive you by any means. Remember, Jesus says most people are going to be deceived. Let no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you. We believe the Bible and the Holy Spirit. They are the ones who tell us the truth. Paul says anyone speak not according to this word, let them be accursed. Have nothing to do with them. Even if it's an angel of God. And angels, you know, we'd all listen to an angel. Paul says, unless they're saying this, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. Let no man deceive you by any means. That day will not come. What's he talking about? The final day that we're looking at. Except there come a falling away first. The Greek word is apostasia. A great, everyone's going to turn away from the truth. That's going to happen before this day comes. Now, we're seeing a massive turning away. 
you cannot believe in a generation how many people would now say they, they are not Christian in our nation. It is unbelievable when you look at a generation ago where almost everyone said they were nominally Christian at least. Now, most don't. A falling away first. People have to fall away because they've got to be deceived. If they, if they read their Bibles, they can't be deceived, but people don't. Even Christians don't. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of of perdition. The word there is apollyon, apollyo. Uh, the NIV might say the one doomed to destruction, which is what perdition means. The only other time that phrase is used, the son of perdition, is used of Judas. It's where Judas is described by Jesus. He's called the son of Perdition. So if you just read there in Thessalonians, it describes what's going to happen again during this time. He's going to oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or all that is worshipped so that he is sitting in the temple of God. So he's going to have a temple to place himself in, showing himself that he is God. This is why you've got to remember when we're looking at this thing called Antichrist, this isn't just an isolated teaching. It's all the way through the Bible. I mean, this entire chapter is about Antichrist that Paul's talking about. The, the one in Revelation, it's the entire chapter is about Antichrist. That every book of the Bible mentions in some way aspects of Antichrist, either directly or indirectly, often very directly. John talks about him an awful lot to describe who he is. Some churches have never mentioned him in 10 years of teaching. Something that is so massive in the Bible, and there are some Christians who have never heard teaching on him. So why has God given us all this teaching if we're supposed to ignore it? I think God knows what he's talking about, do you? I think if God tells us a lot about this, we should be listening so we're not deceived. Shows himself God. Do you remember that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Paul can't have been a great pastor if he thought his uh, congregation would remember anything he said, but never mind. Go on to the next verse. You know what is withholding him back that he may be revealed in his time. So there's something holding him back at this moment. The final Antichrist cannot be revealed. Something, right, what is holding him back? And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. There is someone holding it back. A person, the Holy Spirit, he's holding back the final onslaught of Antichrist. Why? Because he wants everyone to be saved. Now, he knows everyone isn't going to be, but that's not his will. His will is for all to be saved. And then, when this thing is removed, then the lawless one will be revealed and then the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth at the splendor of his second coming. So there's the removal first, then there is the second coming after that. So if we think that Jesus is giving us very strong clues here um, of who the son of perdition is, if we go to the first epistle of John, remember John writing again, first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 18, John tells us something else about Antichrist. Or the spirit of Antichrist, or the religious aspect of Antichrist. Remember, it's more than just one thing. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Have you heard Antichrist is coming? Even now, many Antichrists have come. Do you know there have been many Antichrists? Do you know there's been lots of them? Do you know there's some in our church? Oh, how long have you been in this church? If you've been in this church 10 years, you've seen some antichrists in this church. Remember what antichrist means? Someone who puts themselves in the place of Christ. Doesn't mean they aren't gifted, anointed. Doesn't mean they weren't called. It means they suddenly replace Jesus with themselves. How? This is how John 
describes them. This is how we know it's the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. What's John talking about? He's talking about people who were part of the church, who went and who never really belonged to us, but we thought they did. Now, I think John's got a very specific person in mind. Because we've already seen he's called the son of perdition. There is only one person other than Antichrist called the son of perdition in the Bible. That is Judas Iscariot. John chapter 17 verse 12. John chapter 17 verse 12. Jesus is talking about his church. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. Flip to the King James. I kept them in your name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus knew there was an antichrist in his team. There's always an antichrist in the church, somewhere. In Jesus' team, it was Judas. You will notice that Jesus was always warning his church that someone in their group was a devil. Now, they got very shocked about that. Most of them ignored it and didn't believe it because we often think we're more righteous than God and we want to love people, so why is Jesus being mean? And we, we often rationalize that in our mind, but Jesus didn't. Jesus was always very clear. There's always an antichrist in the wings waiting for the devil to use. The devil will always tempt somebody with something to do what he wants, even in the church, even amongst the 12 hand-picked apostles that Jesus himself picked, the devil still gets one of them. Why is that? Because the scriptures must be fulfilled. There will be an antichrist. So, if we go to the final chart, and we'll, we'll wrap up with this. If we look at the son of perdition, just look at one line at a time. And we use Judas as our example because all the signs seem to point to the fact that this religious leader is going to be like Judas was. The son of perdition, the one doomed to destruction. The one who belonged to us but yet didn't really belong to us. Who left us, who betrayed us, who did the things he shouldn't have done and he was the last person you would have expected to have done it but he was the devil all along. Jesus said so. Jesus said so very clearly. He told his disciples he would be. And so if we just look at these seven examples of Judas, it can help you. It will scare you as well. It will help you understand what's going on. Because I think one of the hardest things for us to grasp is that no one knew it was Judas until right at the end. Right at the end, at the last hour, that's when Jesus said who he was. Up until that point, no one guessed. <coughs> Satan is cleverer than you will ever be. And the person he picks to do the most damage will be more manipulative and crafty and deceitful than you could ever imagine. Judas, now if you go to John chapter 13 and verse 2, I've put there, Judas was already there. When is Antichrist coming? He's already there. There's just someone holding him back. He can't do his work. Remember, Judas had been told by the priests that he, they, they couldn't betray Jesus till after the feast. Right? Their plan was not to betray Jesus during the feast of Passover, because they thought there would be a riot. Who made it happen at Passover? Jesus. Jesus blew his cover. Judas did not want to do it then. The priest did not want to do it then. Jesus says, you're doing it now. I'm withdrawing. I'm showing what's happening.
When Jesus, when, when, when he is removed, Antichrist is revealed. When Jesus removes his protection, Antichrist is uncovered. The supper being ended, the devil having already put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Judas was already there. Satan was already to use him. When Satan is planning to attack God's people, he's already got someone in the church to do the work. You've got to know that. And not one person at that table would have thought it were Judas. In fact, most people would have thought he were the nicest guy there. He was already there. Satan had already tempted him. Satan had already prompted him. He'd already got into his heart. He was eating communion, worshipping with them. He was an apostle, and yet he was the devil. And nobody knew. That's what Antichrist is like. Go back to the chart, the second one. Not only was he already there, no one knew. No one knew. There was only Jesus knew. Why didn't Jesus tell everyone? Well, for three and a half years, he kept telling them one of them was a devil. And what did they do? They just didn't really listen. It's like when you're in church, when you're a pastor, Pastor John knows what I'm talking about, you know, an awful lot. You know, sometimes as a pastor, you, you recognize, and you try and tell people, and they go, isn't he a great guy? And you think, what, Satan? Yeah, he's great, he is. He's going he's to try and destroy this church if he can. He's waiting for the right time to pounce. Pastor John alluded to it a little bit this morning. I knew what he was talking about. Most of you wouldn't have known. No one recognized him. Look at John 13, verse 22, same chapter. It's already told us he's already there. He's already taking communion. He's there, part of the church, one of the leaders. So after he's... Sharing with them at the communion table, Jesus was troubled in spirit, says, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. The disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which one of them. Well, it's not me, is it? Judas said that. Judas says, it's not me, is it? The disciples stared at one another, lost to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. John's thinking, I'm going to, I'm going to figure this one out. John always figures it out. Simon Peter motioned to the disciple, asking which one he means, leaning back against Jesus. John says, Lord, who is it? What does Jesus say? Jesus answered, it's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping... The piece of bread he gave it to Judas, the Simon of Son Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Do you know, Judas didn't even know Satan had entered him. He was so deceived, he was already bent on doing what... I have seen people attack churches and leaders and they don't even know Satan's in them doing it. They think they're doing the right thing. Deception. Jesus told him, what you're about to do, do quickly. Judas knew he was rumbled. And he had to go and do it now. Because Jesus knew. Judas didn't know that Jesus knew all along. You see, that's how deceived people get. Oh, the pastor doesn't know. He probably does, you know. That doesn't mean he's going to do anything about it yet. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus... No one knew. I think John saw I was the only one who had a clue. Why? Because John was close enough to Jesus to try and figure things out. If you were at that table, you would have thought Jesus liked Judas the most because he was giving him the favoured piece of bread. That's what the sop was. It was the one you gave to the favoured one at the right hand. John was laid on his bosom. Jesus gave it to the one who had the best place. He was the most honoured leader in the church. He was the devil. The devil used to be at God's right hand, not as deity, but as one of the anointed cherubs that covered. So can we see, go back to the chart. This is what the Antichrist system does. This is who Antichrist is. No one recognizes it until the one reveals it. You won't know unless God shows you. That's why you've got to be totally dependent upon God and not try and figure things out yourself. Satan is far too clever. Next one. Look at this in 9 Luke 9 and verse 1. Was Judas a gifted individual? Oh, yes. How gifted was he? Jesus called the 12 together. That means Judas. He's one of them. 
He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and cure diseases. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom, to go and heal all those who were ill. Judas had genuine gifting, genuine anointing. He was genuinely called an apostle. He could genuinely heal people. Or oh, someone who has gifts of healing is obviously a great man of God, isn't he? Not necessarily. Jesus never said you judge someone by the gifts. He says you judge someone by their fruits. Oh, I've seen him on telly doing great miracles. He's a man of God. You have no idea who he is. You don't know anything about him. Go back to the chart. He had genuine supernatural power. The Antichrist will have supernatural ability to perform miracles. The Bible tells us that very clearly, especially in Revelation. Do not be deceived by signs and wonders. We know the Holy Spirit empowers people for signs and wonders. We know that. But that does not mean that that person is totally correct in all their life. It doesn't mean that. I am tired and I am sick and tired of people telling me that they know someone is a genuine man of God because God used them in uh, supernatural gifts. That does not mean that God will ultimately own that person. God's gifts are irrevocable. God can give gifts and people can still turn to the devil. The devil has very, very strong power. Okay, next one. Was Judas handpicked and chosen by God. Luke chapter 6, verse 13. When morning came, he called his disciples, that's all his followers, and he chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Look at verse 16. Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Why did Jesus pick Judas Iscariot? Yeah. I feel sorry for the other Judas. Because <laughs> everywhere he went, he would say, I'm one of the 12 apostles. Oh, which one are you? Judas. Not that Judas. <laughs> the other one. I would have changed my name. Was he handpicked? Yes. Why did Jesus pick him? Ask Jesus. I don't know. For, because the scriptures would be fulfilled. Jesus picked the 12 and then said, one of you is a devil. Well, what have you done that for? Can't you pick 12 without one being a devil? Can't you, or can't you like make him wear a shirt that says devil or something? So we know 11, the, the, the devil one. No, because Antichrist is there. You have to trust on Jesus or we will be deceived just the same as everybody else was. Go back to the chart. God called me to do this. That doesn't mean you can't turn into a Judas. God can handpick and call you into something and give you supernatural power and you be, all this stuff and you can still turn to the devil if the devil tempts you and you obey him. Next one. Judas, this son of perdition. John 12 verse 5. Why? This is Judas speaking. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. This guy loves looking after the poor. What a great guy. Philanthropic, altruistic. His motives, he's only concerned about helping people. And he's fighting on behalf of the underprivileged. And he's fighting for the orphans and the widows. And he's fighting on behalf of the poor. And he's showing and he's rebuking people. He's even rebuking Jesus. Jesus, you're wrong because I care about the poor. He did not say this because he cared about the poor. But because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Oh, this is a great organization because they care about the poor. Do they really? Do you know that? Or does the person asking for you a donation pay themselves such a huge whacking salary they need that money to live their luxurious lifestyle? Do you know where your money goes? I give to this organization. Do you know what the chief executive of that organization pays himself? You know, there are some executives of charities are millionaires. Multi-millionaires. That money has come from donations to the poor. 
And yet Christians lavish money upon them. Judas, oh, he's a very caring, loving person. That's what he says. He's only interested in the poor. The church should be looking after the poor. Yeah, so you can make money out of it. Go back to the chart, then we'll wrap this up. Draw this to a close. Not only does he love the poor and he's philanthropic, oh, he loves Jesus. He really does love Jesus. Look, Luke 22, verse 47. While Jesus was still speaking, a crowd came up. The man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, leading them, he approached Jesus and kissed him. Now, you don't kiss someone you don't love, do you? Well, I don't. I'm not allowed to. Well, that's six people I'm allowed to kiss. Well, he loves Jesus, doesn't he? Because he, you all know the word kiss, but proskunio in Greek is the, is the same word for worship, almost the same word for worship. Proskunio is like, to, to, it means, we use it, it's the word we translate for worship, it means to lean forward and kiss. Oh, he worships and loves Jesus. No, he doesn't. He'll put on an act. Everyone will think he loves Jesus. What does Jesus say? Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Are you still acting are you still putting on a show even as you're being a traitor yes that's what antichrist does it's all a show jesus says it would be better that you had never been born think about what that means better that you had never been born what's going to happen to you don't be deceived by people that put on a show. They can look like they're worshipping. They're not. It's an act to deceive people. Be very careful how you view people on platforms. Because the minute you're on a platform, you're very conscious that you're being watched. And your entire demeanor can change. Watch people when they're not on a platform, if you want to see what they're really like. Finally, Last one. Was he a believer? Now, obviously you're all saying, well, no, obviously he's not a believer. Yeah, we know that retrospectively. But the point is, you wouldn't have said that at the time. That's, that's the point. Obviously, Judas, Judas ultimately wasn't a believer. He was after his own thing. But you wouldn't have said that until afterwards. You'd have thought he was. Dear children, this is the last hour. As you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. How do you know someone's a genuine believer? They won't leave Jesus for anything. They won't abandon his church. How many times do you find people, I don't need the church to believe in Jesus. Uh, actually, you do. Because it's believing in Jesus makes you a part of his church. John's saying, how do you know? Well, because they went out from us. They didn't really belong to us. He just said, Antichrist is coming. Many Antichrists, how do we know? They'll not hang around. Not when after three and a half years they don't get what they want. It's interesting that Judas followed Jesus for three and a half years. That's how long Antichrist can pull it off for. People can deceive you for three and a half years. But after three and a half years, you should, you should have sussed them out, whether they're genuine or not. I would never appoint anyone to any leadership position until I'd known them for a few years. I mean, three and a half, if you're clever, I'm not that clever. I need at least five years, probably ten actually, before I've really sussed someone out. Because I'm not that quick. I'm a bit slow. Was he a believer? Everyone thought so for three and a half years. But then they realized he went out from them to do his own thing without wanting to belong to Christ and his church. So, there we get it. Judas is a perfect example of what this Antichrist system is. There's lots of other things about Judas. It's interesting that he was called Judas, uh, Judah, which is praise. It's actually the name of the, the best tribe in Israel. He had the best name and he was the worst person. It's easy to name yourself something, isn't it? Today, everyone names themselves with fancy naming ministries. I'll not name one, or I'll probably quote an actual one uh, without knowing it. 
you know, I'm the super duper intergalactic ministries that are saving the world type stuff. Some people come up with all sorts of nonsense these days. You know, they're saving the entire nations through a half an hour meeting once a week, but whatever. He was, he's the only one who we know uh, wasn't from Galilee. He, he, he wasn't, he, he was from Kerioth. It's Kerioth, the man from Kerioth, which is a different place from Galilee. Some people think that's an indication that he wasn't actually an ethnic Jew, which means he, he may ag ag again be allusion to Antichrist. Never called Jesus Lord. Called him Rabbi. Believed he was a good teacher. Never fully submitted. So there's lots of things. So today, this deception is everywhere. And Antichrist is everywhere. But those who know their God, Daniel said, will be strong and do exploits. John leaned on Jesus and Jesus told him who he was. When you lean into Jesus, it, Jesus will show you some amazing things. By the Holy Spirit and the word, you will know all things. You test every spirit, you test everything according to the word and the spirit, not according to whether those lists of Judas supply, who is a nice guy, who is genuinely anointed, who he cares for the poor, who he collects money, all these things, they are not the test. The test is the spirit and the word. And John found out from Jesus who Judas really was. Okay, so God bless you all. I think we've had enough for tonight. So next time we'll look at more aspects of the Antichrist system. God bless you all.